there are three big things that are happening uh, to us that haven't happened in our lifetime. I like to measure things so I can see them in numbers and charts and so on. And those three big things are, first, the amount of debt and money creation. How much debt we have, the rate at which we are creating it, and then where are we getting that money from? The Federal Reserve and other central banks printing it. So that has never happened to this degree except for the 1930 to 45 period, which I studied before. And I needed to go back and study that in history. The second of those two things is the amount of internal conflict, populism of the left and the right, irreconcilable differences, with the largest wealth gaps that have existed, so the greatest political gaps, the greatest amount of populism, largest wealth gaps, um, since you have to go back to the 1930 to 45 period, and actually it's larger than that, and you have to go back to 1900 to see that. By the way, if you want to see it, you'll see the charts in that. So um, we have a financial issue, we have an internal conflict issue that has very big implications for how well our country is run, but also what does it mean for taxes? What does it mean for the value of assets? I need to understand that. And the third was um, international conflict. Um, so in my whole lifetime, the United States was clearly a dominant power and we were in the American world order. 1945, the United States was, became the leading world power, counted for half world GDP, we had 80% of the world's money because gold was money then, and we had a military monopoly. And so the reason that um, we were the world's power, that's why the United Nations is in New York and IMF and World Banker in Washington, so dominant pro. But uh, we could see this conflict, this emerging competition. And I didn't, the last time that happened was the 1930 to 45 period, and I need to study that. And so I studied that pattern and these are the big things in our lives right now, but we don't, are not acquainted with it. And I, so I needed to study the rise and declines of currencies, the rise and declines of empires. And because these cycles go on um, over a long period of time, I needed to see enough of those cases. So I had to go, uh, go back, let's say, the 500 years. So I studied all of those. Now, I'm not an, ac an academic, I'm a practitioner. So it's not like I'm writing history books. It's, for the purpose of making decisions today. So I think it's important for you and everybody to understand that you're not, you shouldn't look at the value of the dollar in relationship to other currencies as much. I mean, they're all bad currencies. So we can get into why Europe is a bad <laughs> currency and why the yen is a bad currency. They're all bad currencies. And they are all depreciating in buying power just like the 30s, just like the 70s. They all depreciate in relationship to what they can buy. A currency is money. Um, but when we look at them, one in relationship to another, we may not pay attention to that. So that's our existing set of circumstances. You know, okay, the answer is um, the euro. Are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, um, we can go on about Europe's situation. Wow, oh my God. And then, and then, okay, what, what are they doing in the end? They're, they're just printing the money, whatever it is. And so the question is, what is a storehold of wealth? You know, money is uh, a medium of exchange or a storehold of wealth. And it's not a good storehold of wealth when the interest rate you're receiving is much less than the inflation rate. So that's what you're seeing happen. We will, over the next 10 years, certainly, I think, be trying to find the answer of what is the storehold of wealth because usually it's, it, it's a money and then a debt instrument in holding that money. But as that goes down, then there is the question of what it is. What is that currency and storehold of wealth? So we're in that place. It's always handy to be the thing that you is your buying power. You're going to see it more in inflation hedge assets. So like if you're thinking about a bond, it's better to think about an inflation hedge bond than to think about, uh, you know, a, a tips or inflation hedge assets along those lines. And I think that you're going to see then uh, the parts of the economy. So, like, I think basically um, if I was saving, 
what would I want to save in? I'd like to save in the things I know that I'm going to need. So I would like to save in, like, my residence, my house. I would like to save, if I could, pay forward my kids' education, pay forward the food or the health care that I can, and so on. I would want, want to mm. save in those things to buy forward the things I need, most fundamentally. I think if we start to think that way, not only in terms of the investment, but what are, what are even the meat and potatoes type of businesses that are doing that? And then also, I think that um, you have to think geographically. Yeah. Where is best in the world? Okay, that, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, uh, best in the world are countries in which they're earning more than they're spending and their balance sheets are, have more assets and liabilities on them, that they're civil with each other and not, they're not in conflict, and that they're not in risk of an international war. It's basically those fundamentals. And then I would say we are in an intellectual revolution that our capacity to invent and think and use technologies to help us think has never been greater than before. And so those revolutionary type of technologies when they're cutting edge, I think that those are good investments. And I think then what you have to do is also diversify. That because the, the thing I learned is um, um, it's all return in relation to risk. Everybody looks at how much return you make, but it only takes one time to knock you out. You know, I've, we've been doing, Bridgewater has been doing this 47 years and we survived. You have to survive first. It only takes one time to knock you out of the game. And so you should never lose more than X amount of money that you can't recover. Because you lose 50%, it takes 100% to get back. Uh, again, uh, when I say these things, I use measures. Um, there are 18 measures of health. And they're measures of things like, what is your percentage of world GDP? What is your percentage of exports? How are your reserve currency? But also, what is your education level, level of education? What is your competitiveness? 18 measures of that. And um, we are in decline. We're declining on a relative basis, but even also some measures in an absolute basis. Um, so that's what the arc is. And then uh, China has been the leading competitor. Um, I've been having, uh, f f uh, not since 1984, I've been going to China. I watch it since I started going there. Per capita income has increased by 26 times. And so if you use measures of comparability in military, technology, share of world GDP, all of that, uh, you see that. That's, that is the only real power. Um, there are military powers, but history has shown if you're um, a military power and you're not an economic power, while you may be a threat, um, you're not going to win the war. So that's what that, the picture looks like. It's all a matter of basics. Can't, do you earn more than you spend? Okay, do you have a good income saving? And do you have a good balance sheet? Like, it's, 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 it's really simple, you know? Um, the way the system works is if you give a lot of money and credit and you make it cheap enough, they will spend it. Okay, but when you create debt, um, it's stimulative over the short run and depressing over the long run. Because when you have to pay it back, then you have to um, earn more than you spend to pay it back. So what do you do with that debt? Okay. It, if, if you make it tough to pay it back, then what happens is you have a, a, an economic downturn. If you make it easy, you print the money. And those are, that's the cycle. So when we look at what the Fed has done, the Fed and the government together gave an enormous amount of debt and credit and created a lurch forward, it, a giant lurch forward, and created a bubble, okay? And now they're putting on the brakes. Okay, so now we're going to create a giant lurch backward, I think, because it's simple. The amount of, we talk about inflation. Inflation is a very simple thing. It's the amount of money that's spent, money and credit spent, divided by the quantity sold is the price. And so if you take that money away, then, you're, then you, you can't get rid of inflation. The way you get rid of inflation is to get people to spend less. And that is what an economic downturn. 
So the cycle goes like that, and then when you get to the point where, let's say, the economic pain is greater than the inflation pain, then you see them do the opposite. So we're going through that particular cycle. So it's, I think, a delusion to believe that, okay, what they're going to do is uh, deal with inflation and it'll all go away because they'll deal with inflation by doing that without realizing what that means in terms of that. But because of the size of the issues we're dealing with, it's not something that we're used to in terms of its magnitude, I think. So, and then if we take the internal conflict factor, I, mean, I think we have to look at all three because they play a role. And so it, it's traditionally, those three things are the perfect storm, right? They all affect each other. So if, we, if you have a bad economic situation, as you said, it affects one group of people and it hurts them, then you have an internal political conflict, right? The left and the right, the rich and the poor and so on. And then that affects things and vice versa. And then of course the external conflict, the cost of the external conflict. Like for example, um, it's estimated that so far um, um, the cost of two to the Ukraine war, of the Ukraine war to NATO, is something like eight, eight trillion dollars. If you look at, um, to rebuild, are we gonna rebuild? Are they gonna rebuild? They ask the NATO countries like they ask the European countries. Uh, are you gonna put in? Well, they're broke, and they're gonna put in. Then if you d look at the cost of climate change, climate change um, is approximately $10 trillion a year. Um, if you look at um, the cost of building infrastructure, if you look at the cost of all of those costs and you add up those costs, those are, it's not like we're going to stop the spending. So you have to achieve that financial balance in some kind of a way. Right now, um, governments, governments are like people, meaning uh, when you spend, you think the, the basic economics works the same. The only difference is they get to print money. So when you spend, you think, how much money do I have to spend? And then wherefore, what do I prioritize it on? Uh, Governor Lamont has that challenge. We all have that challenge, not the federal government. So what happens is the government says, what do we need to spend money on? And they then go spend the money and we don't have that balance. So that issue is a big fundamental issue, particularly when we have populism on both sides. 